Okay, Mark, we've got 40 people here now. I think we're, we're good. Okay. Now the number keeps going up. Yeah. Want to wait another minute or so? Yep. Let's wait okay. another minute. Okay, why don't we start? Welcome everybody to the third annual multidisciplinary urban capstone project showcase. This year we have nine very impressive projects. The teams have put in thousands of hours on their project and it shows in the results. It's very, very impressive. Before we start, I would like to thank both the project sponsors and the faculty supervisors for their time uh, they put in if, in guiding uh, the teams and I would also like to thank Catherine Danks for the yeoman efforts she has put in to managing administering the whole program so uh, without further ado I'll pass it over to Catherine and she will take us through the whole showcase thank you thank you Mark um, we're going to start with a land acknowledgement that the university, uh, the official one from the University of Toronto. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. This is our official statement, but I know many of us have, uh, have had lots of um, thoughts about where we're going with the um, Indigenous rights and the wrongs that have been done to our Indigenous population in Canada. And um, I just want you to think for a minute about your, where you are and uh, what you're supporting or where you feel you should be supporting our Indigenous population. I also want to, um, there is a University of Toronto statement on Zoom bombing, which I want to um, make clear at the beginning of our meeting. In the case of a Zoom bombing, the event will be ended immediately and we will reach out to you about next steps. So if for any reason we do have a Zoom bomb, we will, um, um, I'll give a statement, we'll close down this uh, link I'll send an email to everyone invited and we will uh, regroup on another, on another link. Okay, so now we begin our formal part of the uh, design showcase presentation. As uh, Mark mentioned, we have nine different um, uh, teams and uh, the format in this case is gonna be six minutes for presentation and a four minute critique for questions afterwards. That leaves five minutes in between to move to the next group so that they can get set up and uh, begin their presentation. I will time these and allow, um, I, I will give a one minute warning before your six minutes is up and um, hopefully we'll, get through, we'll move through this very quickly. Um, so to begin tonight, we're going to start with the group Restore the Core. So for those who are in that group, are you, uh, are you prepared to take it over from now or for now? Yes, thank you. Okay, hi everyone. We are the Canadian in Urban Institute Capstone team. My name is Priscilla and I'm from the Daniels Faculty of Architecture. The pandemic has emptied the downtown core and commercial buildings in major cities across Canada. Underutilized and vacant buildings have the potential to be revitalized. 
but there's currently no holistic framework for selecting buildings for conversion. This led us to re research what factors determine which commercial sites in the downtown cores are suitable for redevelopment. Our team selected Regina as our test city to research this question due to the downtown Regina's declining population, housing incentives, and clear zoning of warehouse buildings in the downtown districts. Hi everyone, my name is Jaiwan. I'm from Rotman Commerce and I'll be going over our design. So we designed a framework to evaluate a building's suitability for conversion from commercial to residential. This framework consists of a series of questions or checklists in six categories. These are amenities, social services, economics, policy, architecture, and environment. We use these to create a scoring system where the scores in each category are summed to produce a number or a final score from zero to 100. And these categories are assigned different weights depending on the goals of the user. Through interviews that we conducted with a wide variety of experts and stakeholders, we ordered the questions in the framework based off of the accessibility of the information, so from most to least accessible. This allows our framework to be used as an assessment tool more easily for specific buildings, and it can also be used as a step-by-step -step guide to find potentially suitable buildings for conversion. Hi everyone, this is Anne and I'm from the Department So using the criteria from our framework, we evaluated two test buildings in downtown Regina. So the first building is 1820 Hamilton, uh, which is a nine story building used for offices. It checks off all of our amenities and social services criteria as it is a walkable distance from dozens of services. The whole downtown area is soon from commercial use, which means an amendment would be necessary to convert this building into residential units. However, the city of Regina plans to increase its downtown residential population by 5,000 people, which is in support to conversion projects. It scores high on the architectural and environmental sections because much of the building materials could be reusable in the conversion. The applicants are up to date and energy efficient. Hi, I'm Angel from Geography and Urban Planning, and I'll be talking about our second test site, 1919 Rose Street. Because it's in the same neighborhood as the first site, about a block away, the scores for the amenities, social services, and policies were very similar. We realized that this would be the case for most buildings close to one another, since these three criteria depend on the building's surrounding neighborhood. However, the economic, architectural, and environmental criteria were lower for the site compared to 1820 Hamilton because the building is over 50 years old. We were able to interview the building owner of Rose Street who kindly gave us details about the vacancy, rent, architecture, and appliances in the building. And this information was used in the second round of testing which produced a much more accurate result. The building received a high score of 74, which means that it has potential for redevelopment into residential units. Hello, um, I'm Anoja and I'm from the Faculty of Information and I will talk about the usability testing for the Frameworks Assessment Tool, which was built using a GUI user interface built through Python. Um, during the first round of testing of the tool, we learned we needed to reorder the questions to make it easier, make the easier criteria that influence the preliminary score appear first. During our second round of usability testing with the building owner, we learned that we needed to display how the criteria scores were valued and make the scores adaptable to all needs, especially because not all criteria will be valued the same way we designed it for every future assessment and stakeholder. We also tested the usability with CUI staff, which helped further refine the questions, both testing the processes, both testing processes help refine our ideas, scores, question, and the overall accuracy and usability of our assessment tool. Finally, this group does not intend the assessment tool to be the sole means of assessment. So the tool should be used in synchronous with interviews with local officials and research on local political and economic conditions. In the future, this assessment tool has the potential to be adopted to integrate asset mapping, machine learning, and an enhanced user interface. We hope this framework will be a valuable resource to the local community, stakeholders, and our client, and assist in incentivizing and selecting buildings for conversion. Thank you so much for listening, and we now welcome any questions or comments.
That's perfect. You're under six minutes. So anybody who has a question, especially your clients, um, please uh, go ahead and ask. I don't have a question. I, I just want to applaud. This is Jennifer from CUI. I just want to applaud the, the group's hard work. Um, they went through a really iterative process. They tested a lot of their um, criteria and assumptions. And I think not only is their tool really valuable for the project that they designed and the scope we were looking for, but it's actually very flexible and adoptable to lots of different uses. So I see it being really useful as a tool going forward. Thank you, Jennifer. Mark, uh, I think your hand is raised. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, just a question about did you, what alternative criteria did you explore and evaluate other than the ones that you identified? Um, I guess I'll hop in. Um, so actually we had divided some of the criteria up, like um, especially for policy, we broke it up. Um, kind of like like po politics and then like bylaws and like all of those things. So we got really like intricate, but we realized that we needed to actually like make it more general <laughs> than very specific. So actually we've uh, actually made the criteria a lot more general than before. So that's how our, our design actually really changed from being very specific to becoming more generalizable um, for building assessment. So I hopefully that answered the question, Mark. <laughs> And did you evaluate each of those went separately or, or what? Yeah, so uh, we evaluated. So we did a few rounds of testing um, in the beginning, and we realized that some of those questions were not like easy to answer, but also like the wording wasn't correct. And so we had to like those changes. We we actually learned through testing um, the product and um, and seeing what could be answerable. Um, so we made those changes and the section just became like policy um, rather than like splitting it up into like, you know, the po political side of things to like bylaws. We just made it policy and narrowed down the questions and made it um, a lot more easier to answer. Um, but it really happened through like the testing process because we didn't realize how, um, you know, as specific our questions were. Thank you. Aaron, you have your hand up. Oh, just uh, wanted to say fantastic work. And I know you guys went through so many different iterations. So it's great to see where you ended up. And if, if we have time, I had a quick question, which is how do you see this tool working in other types of contexts? Like, could it work in Toronto? Could it work in Halifax? What do you think? Uh, I think um, our tool is we had designed it so that it would be applicable to many cities, like all cities in Canada, um, which is why our criteria is purposely a bit vague, like Anoja said, because um, down like all downtowns have similarities, but each one is different. Um, so the tool that we made, you can actually change the weighting of each of these criteria depending on um, who's using it, like what stakeholders using it, if it's a building developer or the city, um, so that it will come out with different scores depending on the weights. And I think that's why it's, it's pretty generalizable to other cities. Thank you to all of you from Restore the Core. That was, uh, oh, sorry, I'm not on video. That was a wonderful presentation and congratulations. Uh, and thank you for starting to kick off our evening. You know, it's hard to be the first, but thank you all for, for being here. Um, our next uh, group is the group of the Year of Public Art. So uh, if you want to get organized and get set up, let me know when you're ready.
Okay, are you ready to go? Yeah, we are. All right, great. Um, you have oh, you have six minutes. Uh, I'll let you uh, know when five minutes has gone by, and you have one minute left. Go ahead. Okay, sounds good. Hello, everyone. I'm Irene, and I'm working with Maria and Katrina on this project. Our supervisor is Professor Mark Fox, and our client are Katrina, Nadia, and Joe from the City of Toronto and Process. So going into the background of our project, the Toronto Public Art Strategy Development Art with Teal and Process is a 10-year plan that aims to strengthen and regulate the City of Toronto's commitment to public art. The strategy presents a vision to have public art spread all across Toronto and enhance community engagement through an understanding and celebration of the history, diversity, and culture tied to each site. Going into our program statement, as the city continues to deploy strategies to enhance public art throughout the cities, there continues to be a lack of public art services outside of the downtown core regions. Through an exercise in mapping, we located all of our related resources and community organizations in the city to highlight the absence in those neighborhoods. An implementation plan to provide creative resources in public space will encourage artists to build relationships with the local community and contribute to Toronto's social and economic well-being. Before settling with our final solutions, we consider alternative solutions such as creating an app, mentorship programs, and guidebooks learning from the pre-existing precedents. We perform an, an, an extensive literature review and consultation process through the distribution of a survey, as well as one-on-one -on -one interviews with a range of stakeholders from experience to emerging artists, art consultants, architects, and local art services organizations. Derived from their advice, concern, and suggestions, we arrive at the following requirement to integrate into the proposal. Skills and technical training, professional development, community engagement, historic legitimation, resource accessibility, improved transparency, and interdisciplinary partnerships. These requirements can be used to measure the impact of the intervention design. Hi, so for our proposal, we design public art service stations, which we envision as shared mobile studio spaces that would be distributed in the neighborhoods of Toronto that lack art-related resources and organizations. These stations would operate in shipping containers reconfigured to store various art supplies for public access and for mentors to host workshops through. These stations would exist temporarily on a site then move around to each neighborhood that requested services. Um, and prior to distributing a station in the select neighborhood, passbooks would be used in combination with community consultation to collect information about a neighborhood's public art goals, concerns, and suggestions. Storytelling and visual prompts are included for users to fill out when distributed in community centers, local facilities, and on virtual platforms. Hired program coordinators would review collective responses and determine strategies to enhance access to public art resources. Filling out these passbooks acts as an entry to join upcoming workshops. And lastly, it provides a space for artists, community leaders, and organizations hosting a workshop to showcase their relevant work and reference existing resources. Workshops that operate through PASS encourage hands-on learning, skills training, and professional development facilitated by mentors. They will conduct workshops to involve the community to participate in the process of designing art. And since PASS will be located in public areas such as parking lots or green spaces, it is important to determine the accessibility of these areas. So we incorporated the set criteria that includes the walk score um, of the neighborhood, access to public transit, and proximity to Main Street, each ranked from level one to four based on minutes or distance. Within our final report, we also included questions developed by Access Art from their Accessibility Information Survey. So these questions in combination can be used to guide where the station will be located. In order to ground the framework of PASS into a possible reality, we chose the neighborhood of Victoria Village due to its low walk score and lack of public art, resources, and programs. Within Victoria Village, we imagine the past station existing adjacent to the Jonesville Allotment Gardens to take advantage of the high community involvement and program of collaborative gardening. Within this context, we began applying our implementation plan consisting of four phases. 
Community consultation includes sourcing funding, applying for grants, marketing outreach, and meaningful consultation with artists, neighborhood residents, community organizations, and local business owners. This is very important in determining the locally specific requirements to enhance public art initiatives in selected neighborhoods. Station distribution would be guided through the site selection section in the passbook. Users within the chosen neighborhood would recommend public spaces where the station can be situated. A shipping one container- minute, Sorry, one minute warning. Thank you. Will be sourced and transformed into a shared workshop space that includes modular furniture pieces, which store art supplies. Station equipment will be collected as, the need, as needed based on the workshop plan, prioritizing local businesses to supply materials and tools. The adjacent space surrounding the station is included for users to socialize, perform work outdoors, and display art. Once the pass is set up, the workshop initiation phase will begin. Those who utilize the station will be introduced to their mentors and local artists in the neighborhood. Workshops are important for interdisciplinary relationship building, sharing stories, and placemaking through the production of art. Finally, the impact assessment will allow community members to reflect on their experience and use the station for personal art production or other programming that fits the interest of the local community. In this case, the past coexists with the market, sharing the produce from the allotment garden. Thank you. Thank you very much, Year of Public Art. That was great. You came in right on time. Um, it, I'm gonna open it up to uh, your clients and supervisor and perhaps Mark for questioning. Um, Katrina from the city of Toronto here. And I just wanted to say, um, it's been a pleasure working with you three. This covers um, so many parts of the Toronto public art strategy and um, the past stations work so well and solving so many of the problems that we have, like trying to get some more artwork outside the core, community involvement, um, and mentorship programs that we're looking to do in the future. So hopefully we can see some of these in real life one day. Congratulations. Thank you. I was gonna, Joe Seller is here from the city of Toronto too, uh, working on our works deal with Katrina. And um, it's uh, it's impressive work and really appreciate it. And just wanna say that, you know, our works, the, the year of public art is the largest, uh, largest arts and cultures uh, initiative that the city's done in its history. So the work that you're doing is extremely relevant and uh, wanted to thank you for your time and dedication. Does anyone have any questions for a year of public art? Okay, well, thank you very much, Year of Public Art. We're going to move now to reimagining schoolyards. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna. My three team members and I are working on a project with the Toronto Lands Corporation, where we are reimagining schoolyards in the downtown core. To give a brief outline of this project, the TDSB is facing rapid intensifications and overcapacity in local schools. Um, in response, the Toronto Lands Corporation is looking to create new designs, formula, formulas within mixed use urban spaces for playgrounds by considering design and procedural shifts to better incorporate schools into redevelopment plans. For this project, we identified five components that were critical to consider into our research design, that being cost, financing, functionality, health, community integration, and sustainability. Our designs also included research on policy, including information on section 37, accessibility, signage, and fencing. Uh, so the decision-making process flow chart maps out the process leading up to our designs of the prototype sites, and it can be broadly applied to future projects. We first identify a site in need for a schoolyard to be incorporated into mixed use development. These could include schools in the downtown area with limited space, urban and residential areas in development in need of schools to serve a projected increase in student numbers, 
and also schools in, in need of major renewals and repairs where opportunities to replan and incorporate schoolyards with surrounding environments exist and may be more cost effective. We then identify the characteristics of the site to learn what design and strategies can be implemented, such as relevant policies, existing relationships between stakeholders, and also the best placement of the schoolyard within the site evaluated through a decision matrix of requirements. We've broadly identified condo podiums, rooftops, and public sharing spaces like parks as the three placement alternatives that schoolyards in urban areas can be incorporated into. And these three alternatives can be mixed and matched depending on the different sites. After deciding how to incorporate the schoolyard into the existing infrastructure, we can then apply best practices we've learned from other cases and also propose similar schemes to navigate the characteristics of the site, as well as determine the list of playground programming spaces within a schoolyard to satisfy our design principles. Some of the design principles include framing with trees, having generous play supports, and also accessibility and circulation. Finally, we design the solution by developing prototypes of the physical design, as well as action plans for any programming schemes and stakeholder agreements needed to realize the project. So we were given two sites to develop the design plan. The first site is proposed for a three-story um, school that serves 450 to 550 students from junior kindergarten to grade eight. After evaluating the best alternative, the design uses the rooftop of the school and the shared public space nearby, as well as the front yard of the school. We first distributed creative recess and activity zones based on their accessibility and site circulations. Fencing and signage ideas were also brought up at this stage. For example, the rooftop area needs consideration of fences to prevent students from falling off the roof. The Corkdown Commons, which is the public space, is a playing field that is accessible from the street and by community members. Therefore, signage and fencing ideas are of particular importance. In the early stage of the design, we made distinction between soft, hard, and natural landscapes um, corresponding to the access points. Since there is limited space on the site, we combine programs that could share the same space and equipment, and also put programs that may benefit from each other uh, in close proximity according to their groups. Some programs are separated by age of students and by activity for safety and management purposes. For example, the Crookdown Common Area became a field for gathering events and sport activities, while the basketball um, court sits on the rooftop for older students that need hard surface play space. In the final design, Trees and safety barriers um, work as soft and hard fences. The trees are also sound barriers to block the disturbance from the GO train railway behind the site. High fences are implemented on the rooftop to prevent students from falling off and to, uh, prevent them from throwing the basketball off. At the intersection of the Corkdown Common playing field uh, and the schoolyard, we place signs and barriers to restrain community members from trespassing the area during school hours. Um, so for the Christie site, the site is a 27.7 acre mixed use development plan with the opportunity for two elementary schools, the TDSB and the TCDSB, um, integrated into the 8,840 meter squared condo podiums to serve 1,100 students in total. So the alternatives um, evaluation showed that the best approach is using both the condo podium and shared public space. Um, after distributing creative recess sport activity zones based on their accessibility and site circulations, we also discussed the potential places for fencing and signage. Uh, so for example, the community park is accessible uh, from the three uh, sides of the street and it's also close to the community center on the east side. So signage is important to inform people of the school property. Um, so at this stage, we propose that uh, we could design the landscapes connecting to the entries at different programs nearby. Uh, since the space on this site is more generous, we were able to allocate more space to each program with less overlap, but the um, programs are still separated uh, by age of student for safety and management purposes. So for One example- One minute warning. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so for example, we have allocated uh, the meet and greet spaces with the bike racks on both ends of the park, considering that students may be accessing the schoolyard from both sites. Um, and then the play spaces for the kindergarten students are placed separately on the podium because it's easier for the staff uh, to supervise the younger students in smaller areas. And so uh, the design outcomes for this site are, um, so we also place trees and safety barriers as fences across the site to separate for different program uses. So railings hidden behind the welcome back to school illustration um, are implemented on the condo podium to prevent young students from falling over. And lastly, at every crossroad in the community park, we intend to place signs and barriers to keep uh, community members off the space uh, when the nearby spaces are being used by the students. So that concludes our presentation. Thank you so much for listening.
Thank you to the Reimagining Schoolyards team. Uh, Mark Richardson, you have your hand up. Can you guys see and hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, obviously, uh, I'm a volunteer with housingnowto.com. We track affordable housing sites and um, some of the housing now sites uh, are starting to include uh, school buildings in them. So I'm, I'm very interested in this, uh, particularly the stuff you were talking about on the Christie site. So you said there were a couple, there's an opportunity for two elementary schools. Would, would the two elementary schools share a common playground between them? Is that your vision? Um, and it, it, will this full poster be available electronically somewhere? Because uh, there's just a smaller version of it that in the book that came out today. Um, so for the Christie site, um, as we were told by our client, we were to just imagine the play space used by the TDSB school at this stage. But um, because it's the space is so generous, we believe that with like enough programming and circulation like strat strategies, like it can be shared by two school. That's our uh, vision. And if you would like, we can ask Catherine to forward you this poster if you want. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. I'd be happy to, Mark. Uh, does anyone else have a question for the uh, re Reimagining Schoolyards team? Not a question, but this, so my name is Paul. I'm the Toronto Lanes Corporation staff member that the team's been working with. And uh, just want to thank the team for months of amazing work on this. This is Toronto, Toronto's transforming itself and becoming a, an incredibly dense city in, in air parts, portions of the air of the city that were never visioned as as dense neighborhoods, as tall neighborhoods, uh, which is making the TDSB really have to rethink how they view schools and where schools can go. Um, you know, it, it you know, you could potentially look at this as the, you know, this could be the, the swan song for your seven acre school site. So ideas like this, visions like this are what we really need as we as we start to move forward with, with planning for future schools in, in the city. And again, the, the team did a fantastic job and I just wanted to thank them again. Great, Maddie, you've got your hand up. Go ahead, Maddie. Thanks, Catherine. Hi, everyone. Um, I also wanted to just, uh, echo the sentiments and congratulate the team. I think we're on the cusp of something really special here uh, of transforming how we think about schools and also uh, all sorts of different public uses that we used to think had to be in their own facilities on their own, often surrounded by parking lots. Uh, and I think the project that the team has done uh, has advanced our thinking on what's possible. And I also wanna uh, acknowledge uh, TLC uh, and your work on this and your work bringing us uh, and uh, other folks in to start uh, rethinking what's possible uh, and, and, and uh, opening, up, uh, uh, opening up to new ideas. I think the city is really at a point of transformation. I think we're going to, and I think the work you're doing along with the students uh, is really uh, special and important. So thanks to both of you. Thanks to the students and thanks to TLC for your contribution to this too. Thank you. Thanks, Maddie. Um, does anyone else, else have a question or two for reimagining schoolyards? Okay, if not, then we will thank, uh, move on to ConnectTO. Uh, so can that group please get set up? Oh, Maddie, your hand's still up. Is that another question or? Oh, okay, we're down. All right, good. ConnectTO, go ahead. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Sure, I'm, I'm just trying to share my screen right now.
sorry, I think we're just having some technical difficulties with sharing. Give us. Okay. Um, we'll give you a few more minutes. I have your um, poster, but I would not be able to know where to zoom. So. Okay, so hopefully everyone is able to see that now. Um, hello, everyone. Our names are Janine, Bea, Ania, and Carolina, and we have been working on the ConnectTO project. ConnectTO is a council supported program at the City of Toronto that aims to bring accessible and affordable high speed internet for all Toronto residents, especially to those living in marginalized communities. The city has asked our team to design a feedback tool that could be used to track um, the social and financial con constraints of internet access for underserved residents of Toronto, along with the impact that the Connectio program has made to their lives. Our team decided to design and create a robust survey as a tool to support and advance the existing data that the city has collected on internet use, affordability, and mobile infrastructure. Sorry. So in the initial stages of our design process, it was important for our team to keep in mind certain limitations within the scope of our project. Um, the main limitations we faced were time for the project in terms of the limited duration of the project as a whole, as well as logistical factors when setting up meetings with a possible participant pool. Um, budget was also something we had to consider as it narrowed our options as a lack of monetary incentive would prove to be difficult in encouraging participation. Finally, accessing larger databases was also a limitation given that some information is not made public. This also meant that our team had limited access to possible participant pools given required training needed before dealing with community participation. In the beginning of our design process, our team first considered constructing field interviews, but this proved not to be feasible given required ethical training and the current situation with COVID-19. We then turned to data mining as an option, but then found that there are no current tracking systems implemented within the pilot pr program on internet literacy or internet use, making this option quite difficult to carry through. Um, we also looked at creating a prototype feedback system via a website, but due to the extensive knowledge on website building and computer programming required, we found this to be impractical. Finally, we found that while a content analysis would be feasible given budgetary and time constraints, the deliverables would ultimately be unsubstantial compared to other options, as this option did not deal closely enough with client needs. Oh, so the solution that we came up with um, alongside the help of the city's Connectio team, Michelle and Professor Coleman, was to create a more robust form of a survey that would allow to, for the city to use it as is or use it as a framework for generating new questions based on our criteria. So the survey was created through our understanding of the need for direct feedback from individuals, but created as to work with the constraints we were put under. So the categories we put the survey questions into include those about family dynamics, so we can pick out important demographic information um, service provider information, so we can gauge how families' money is being allocated to broadband use. Um, a section about internet use, which would help us understand um, families' internet needs and where the time on the internet is going. Um, so the survey was also built in a way that would allow for question funneling, um, where participants would be brought to certain sections based on their answers to ensure the survey would be as user-friendly as possible. And with this, we also created a council report. So this consisted of our research rationale, basically saying why this is something that um, Connectio needs, um, our set of survey questions and categories, and our recommendations. Um, so our survey questions were displayed in a plain text format, as well as we made a flowchart visualization for them, just to make it easier to see the funneling. Um, and yeah. The recommendations we sent alongside with the council report are survey incentive, 
CIRA Internet Performance API, and knowledge mobilization. We recommend incentivizing eligible residents to fill out the survey. One suggestion is to provide survey participants with the opportunity to be entered into a draw for a gift card containing a certain amount, such as $50 for every 100 responses. This rationale behind providing this kind of um, incentive is to leverage the participation's connection within the household, community, and personal network so that more responses will be generated. The second recommendation is to add a Canadian Internet Registration Authority Internet Performance link, which is the CIRA link at the end of the survey, leveraging the opportunity that the survey is being sent to many eligible residents. The CIRA Internet Performance Test is a quick and accurate test of the Canadian Internet connection. The ConnectTO team would be able to overlay demographic and social data to generate a deeper understanding of the current state of connectivity for Torontonians. The last recommendation is about knowledge mobilization of the digital divide. Knowledge mobilization refers to the process of enhancing the communication of difficult jargon that may not be accessible to every community. Working one on minute. translating policy and improving one. the user experience can broaden city engagement and raise awareness regarding digital divide. Sorry, interrupting you, one minute warning. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So to conclude on where Connectio stands and how it will be going forward, unfortunately, we were not able to provide the results of the executive committee meeting because it occurred after the poster submission. Um, but we have learned through our clients that the Connectio project has been deferred until May 4th on the basis that the executive committee would like to have additional supporting documents and more clarification regarding uh, justification for having household connectivity and new inf internet infrastructure along with a success metrics. As well, the committee mentioned that they want more of a comprehensive business plan and cost analysis before continuing phase two of the Connectio program. So that concludes our presentation. Thank you so much everyone for listening and we will now open up to questions. Thank you Connectio. Um, could uh, um, your supervisor or your client please go ahead and ask any questions. Hi, sorry, I'm off camera, but I just want to commend the team for doing great work on a very challenging project. This is an important initiative, and they were really in the weeds or in the midst of it, dealing with uh, city council, the client, and all the rest of it. And um, also, thank you, Michelle Massaro, for your uh, engagement on the project. Thank you, Professor Coleman. It's Marco Narduzzo here from the City of Toronto. I'm not sure if my other colleagues are on now. Sorry, I joined a bit late, uh, but I echo the sentiments. Uh, thank you so much for providing this valuable input into our submission to Executive Committee. This information is incredibly useful, uh, especially moving forward uh, when we're trying to um, demonstrate and ensure we have metrics for uh, success and uh, and the measures are so important uh, to us and uh, this survey and the methodology around the survey is going to help us in that stream too so thank you again for the detailed and professional work provided to the entire team thank you marco thank you marco thank you Anybody else have any questions for Connectio? Okay. Um, thank you, Connectio. We are going to actually move past our break. We are scheduled to have a break right now, but we are 15 minutes ahead of time. So I think we can move along. Um, we've only been at this meeting for 45 minutes. So remote sensors, could you please uh, get ready to uh, start your talk? Can everyone see that? Yes, I can. Uh, okay, can everyone hear me okay? Yep, we, you can be heard. Perfect, awesome, okay. So um, I'm gonna get us started. Uh, hi everyone, I'm gonna give you some background info on our project, Remote Sensors in the Public Realm, and describe a little bit about our requirements. 
As cities begin to integrate smart technology, including remote sensors like traffic cameras and heat sensors, into the fabric of our cities, policymakers must adjust to decide how to best manage the data they collect. In the service of this goal, the City of Toronto is seeking to enhance transparency when it comes to where and how sensors are used in the city's public realm in accordance with the development of their digital infrastructure strategic framework. To meet this objective, the City has asked us that we create pu a public registry that will catalogue and classify these sensors. The requirements of this project were twofold. The first is to comprehensively describe city-owned sensors installed in Toronto. And secondly, to present these in a clear and accessible way to all users, including the public, researchers, and city employees. These requirements act in the service of increasing public awareness and understanding of sensors in the city and enhancing public trust in the city's ability and commitment to handling their data. Now to meet these requirements, we conducted research in a number of different areas that answered the following questions. What information should be shared about city-owned sensors and how should that information be shared? Our stakeholder research played a huge role in contextualizing the registries and users for us, uh, which my teammate Bill will be talking about in just a minute. But before we get to that, I wanted to touch on three additional research areas that really informed our work. The first was a jurisdictional scan, uh, which involved looking at different cities like Amsterdam and New York City for their best practices when it came to developing and maintaining their own registries. We also conducted a policy and legislation review uh, that really informed several of our sensor characteristics or attributes that we included in our registry prototype, including the privacy impact assessment score. And finally, our capstone supervisor turned us on to the value of using ontologies to describe our attributes. We looked into several of these uh, with the goal of structuring and centralizing the city's sensor information. During the development of the community sensor registry, we collected insights through surveys and interviews from multiple stakeholder groups to help inform our design. First, we spoke to subject matter experts. They were interested in a sensor registry that provided detailed sensor metadata, included associated data sets and contact details. Secondly, we spoke to members of the general public who required information about the location of sensors in public spaces and their data collection methods. And lastly, we spoke to the cities of Toronto's divisions and potential registry maintainers. The city and their maintainers require democratic and responsible implementation of a sensor registry to cover the breadth of their sensors and deliver a useful and sustainable tool for asset management. After three iterations of usability testing, we arrived at our final design with this prototype. We came up 28 attributes that can comprehensively describe the sensors in the city. Several examples are shown on this poster. The main page is about the interactive map, which supports five core functionalities. First, the markers with number on the map indicate sensor entities clustered in that region. The search bar allows a user to query for location in the city and focus on that area. On the left-hand side of the page, we enabled a filtering mechanism and the user can use those checkboxes, drop-down menus, and sliding bars to narrow down the range and display only a subset of the sensors that they are most interested in. The filter result is shown in the table below with essential metadata. Users can also click on the full detail button labeled here as number five to see full detailed list of attributes and explore more. We conducted 16 prototype tests and completed three iterations to improve the functions of the registry. On an aggregate level, we implemented five critical design changes. Among the 28 attributes, we developed three attributes to capture the behavior of a sensor that were most important to the public, which focuses on the frequency of data collection, date and time for when data was last collected, and when the data was, gets published on the site. We prioritize sensor owner details in the filter column to help users better familiarize with what organization collects sensor information. We attach pop-up boxes to certain attributes for further explanation. We visually organize our sensor information into batches for easier navigation. Lastly, we represented cl clusters of sensors with assigned numbers as opposed to icons or colors via the interactive map and full details pop-up to minimize the cognitive load in distinguishing between sensor types. In our final report, uh, we detailed the construction of the prototype and our other design decisions uh, to the city, including the sensor attribute list that my uh, teammate Jengdan talked about and the privacy impact assessment score attribute, which was a custom attribute. 
The city has to follow their own processes with regards to budget approval, but they do intend to carry our project forward and make it happen. In the final report, we've provided them with a set of operational recommendations covering a miscellany of topics for the city to consider when moving forward, including one, a set of- Sorry, one minute warning. Awesome. Including a set of technical recommendations for when they're implementing the registries back end and front end, a marketing plan for informing citizens about the new registry, a data collection plan for collecting information about city uh, other city division sensors, and if this project were eventually to be extended, possibly for collecting information from private sensor owners, and finally a maintenance plan covering staffing and other details about how the city should operate the registry when they make it. We're incredibly grateful to our clients at the city and to our supervisor, Professor Mark Fox. Uh, it's been a very interesting project to work on, and we're eager to see it come to fruition and one day see this registry exist on the City of Toronto website. Thank you, uh, remote sensors. That's wonderful. Um, I would like to open it up to uh, any questions, your supervisor, your client, clients. Go ahead, please. Bill, I think you can just talk. You're the only person with your hand up. Okay, just uh, checking uh, in case there was an order. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Nabil Ahmed. I work for the City of Toronto um, and uh, was pleased to work with this team uh, in their research uh, and in, in their development of this census registry. I, I really want to applaud the team for their attention to detail and the really professional manner in which they conducted this project. And the output, uh, you know, you can look at it and it looks like the City of Toronto developed that, you know, uh, the quality of the prototype that they provided was uh, extremely high. Um, and it's, you know, uh, and I really appreciate that they've provided all those detailed notes, uh, including on maintenance even. Um, I think one of the, and, and I'm, in a, in a way, I'm, I'm re confirming, you know, what Gabriel just mentioned that, you know, we are gonna be putting this into action. One of the aspects that we'll be considering is, uh, uh, and I know we've discussed potentially um, placing the research online, but also doing public consultation, uh, you know, on what a, reg a sensor registry could look like. Um, no, having seen other registries from around the world, we know that this will actually be um, really one of the first uh, of its kind in North America. and. Yeah, it's tremendous work that you've done. So congratulations to the team. Thank you so much for the work that you've done. Thank you, Nabil. Does anyone else have some questions for the team? Thanks, Nabil. I, I just wanted to add a few more comments too. It's Marco Narduzzo again from the City of Toronto. I'd like to thank Professor Fox uh, and the team like uh, Nabil mentioned, that the quality of work is uh, it's city of Toronto size. It, it literally <laughs> we can implement this and and put this on our website tomorrow, and it'll look like uh, it, it follows all the standards. So credit to the team. I also just want to say the breadth of work that's included in this sensor registry work, um, the attention to detail. It, it it's just. Uh, a piece of work that that I look forward to implementing and 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 building upon. Um, I meant I mentioned last time with that we we met with the team that um, this this is cutting edge, right? But this is a little uh, ahead of <laughs> our implementation here at the city. But uh, it's great because it's going to provide a guide on how we move forward in this in this space. So. Again, thanks to the team and Professor Fox uh, for the excellent work that's been provided. Thank you, Marco. Um, does anybody else have uh, questions for our remote sensors team? Ah, David? Yeah, I'm just curious about the um, public versus private sensors in the city. Um, what percentage of, if you have a sense, it doesn't have to be exact, but how, what percentage are public sensors versus uh, private sensors and um, how far would this registry go without also enrolling uh, the, the private side?
Um, don't have a strict sense of numbers. I don't think we have that to give to you. Uh, initially, the goal was to cover both, and then uh, due to some reframing decisions on the city and our end, uh, the sensor, the registry currently intends to target public sector sensors or publicly owned sensors, like you said. Um, there are a lot of those, more than you'd expect, is what I'll say from, from talking to the other division at the City of Toronto. So I think it'll still be useful and helpful information and definitely a, a great model and first step if the city intends to take it farther as well. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, remote sensors. If no other questions uh, are around, then we will uh, move on to our next uh, group, affordable housing at 3933 Keel Street. You wanna get set up? Okay, affordable housing, whenever you're ready. Sorry, just give me five seconds just to finish setting up. I couldn't find sure. a button for a second. Yeah, no rush. All right. Uh, okay, so I'll just get started. So hi everyone and thank you for joining us today. So our team project will be covering affordable housing at 3933 Keel Street for today's design showcase. Um, so as you can see here, our site will stand at the intersection of Finch Avenue West in Keel, which is indicated by the red box in title site A. Um, so this site was city owned land, which will be utilized for affordable housing within a mixed income, mixed use and transit oriented community context, which will be done under Toronto's housing network initiative. So Toronto's pre existing affordable housing is unfortunately not adequate to meeting the needs for affordable rental units. Um, additionally, our demographic in the area consists mainly of university age students due to its proximity to York, and the area has a substantial population of low income single parent households. With this in mind and with the city's recommendations in mind, we sought to include a public daycare within our development to meet such population needs. As showcased here in our site contacts map, the Keopinch area is relatively accessible, especially with the addition of the LRT station adjacent to our site. So as our site sits directly adjacent to the Finch West LRT station, it would have been ideal to build directly on the station itself. But our team's assessment of Metrolinx's existing plans revealed that the station box does not have the appropriate structure for that. So our team went on to consider a design that aimed to utilize a cantilever, which unfortunately proved to be outside of our proposed budget. And additionally, the cantilever raises issues of unsustainability regarding weight and cost complexity during construction. The increase in space with the addition of the cantilever would also not necessarily offset the building costs for developers or the affordability for the tenants. And it's likely the incorporation of this building form would require additional long-term funding in the form of building maintenance or operational fees. Ultimately, we determined the most feasible design alternative would be a collaboration with the adjacent TD Bank land, which would provide us with more outdoor amenity space and allow for more housing units. But something to note is that this partnership is only a suggestion and is not guaranteed. After considering site restrictions, after potentially merging our site with the TD Bank site, the team came up with nine massing alternatives. Five of, the, of them were on the, given, uh, on the land given to us currently owned by the city of Toronto and four on the larger combined site. To this massing, the team distinguished which options work more than the others. And we concluded that only the building on the combined site that leverages maximum height 
can house 213 units with sufficient space for day care and retail. This option was chosen from a pool of three tall building alternatives on each of the site, site options and tested with and without a can deliver. Since the chosen alternative for the tall building surpassed the 190 unit goal without the need of a cantilever, it was seen as a more feasible, economical, and sustainable alternative to select. So again, the design that best fit the project requirements was the tall building on site B with the proposed 213 units. 107 of those would be affordable. Um, so just breaking down some of the contextualized programming, uh, first is the mechanical penthouse. So feature considerations like lower carbon fuel sources, heat recovery, and ground floor heating could potentially eliminate the need for a mechanical penthouse, which would leave this extra floor area free to be reallocated for more amenities or more units. Second is the outdoor amenities. So in addition to soft landscaping at grade, we imagine the podium being a green roof that transitions into the indoor communal amenities. And third is the retail and commercial. So the building will provide nine leasable spaces between the ground floor and the first level to meet the retail zoning requirements. Um, and in this case, foot traffic was strongly considered. So for example, the ground floor might include coffee shops or active translate, transit related uses, while the upper floor could feature something like health related amenities. And last is the daycare, the keynote being that it needs to meet certain area requirements in order to qualify for the applicable funding. And the surrounding landscape will also include features like grade separated cycling, a wider pedestrian clearway and large street trees, uh, which are all in line with the Kiel Finch secondary plan. As per a review of the Toronto Green Standard, we sought to address stormwater infiltration through bioretention and soft landscaping, such as boomers. There's room for further improvements, such as punch windows, and uh, we're considering reducing energy demand to be the focus, not necessarily generating more energy on site as the latter is less efficient with our site constraints. We might also recommend considering heating and cooling systems and gray water recycling at later stages of the project. Regarding financing and how this development will be funded, we learned a lot about the big picture of affordable developments. And the main difference from typical developments is that there are no equity investors here. So this does change the typical funding sources for construction, but it also means that net cash flow doesn't need a service returns. And we're estimating uh, an ambitious payback period of at least seven years, which is, again, ambitious, but it's in the ballpark of similar revitalization developments. We also made some key assumptions regarding interest rates and subsidies that we're happy to discuss in the Q&A. Okay, you've got one minute left, group. Thanks. As the city moves forward with more transit-oriented development, it's crucial that transit infrastructure must be planned in conjunction with the surrounding area's developments, most notably for mixed use and residential developments. Without an appropriate consideration of the area as a totality, future development plans may face avoidable constraints, so constraints such as our space and constraints as a result of the ability to consider the option of building atop the LRT station. Going forward, we hope that the city prioritizes appropriate planning for future affordable housing developments in transit-oriented communities in ways that are considerate of the location and its future residents. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Affordable Housing Group. Uh, Mark Richardson, you've got your hand up. Do you wanna go ahead? Uh, I first just wanna say thank you to the team. They were an excellent team to work with this year. They took on a number of different challenges, uh, you know, having to look at cantilever as an option, uh, which we wouldn't have to do if Metrolinx was building their stations in a way that would support affordable housing directly above, but that's a different, a different discussion. Um, I, I guess my question to the team would be, if you had another month, what would have been the area of interest that you would have dug into more on this project? Take that one. I think there's a few areas. The two that stand out to me are one, refining the programming, and the second are the sustainability considerations, which we admittedly didn't dig too deeply into from the start of the project. But especially in the context of sustainability for 99 years, uh, we want to avoid things like having to retrofit certain systems in, say, 20 or 30 years, because that would only add cost and maintenance. And it's it's not necessarily in line with the environmental standards that we should be aiming towards. So 
that's for me and if anyone else wants to jump in. Um, I think we'd also sort of look into the collaboration with the TD Bank lands more because it, looking through everything that we've done so far, I think the most feasible option would be making sure that partnership works out as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have uh, some questions for our affordable housing team? Okay, well, if there are no more questions, thank you, affordable housing. We are gonna move on to homeless and parks. So uh, homeless and parks, can you uh, get set up there? All right, if Scarlett's ready, I'll, I can begin. So hi everyone, welcome to our group presentation on our project, Homelessness in Parks, Designing for Dignity. I'm Jessica here today with Rena, Goldie, Scarlett, Maria, and Victoria, and we will discuss the work we conducted alongside park people and Professor David Roberts. To address the issues that people experiencing homelessness face when residing in parks, we have developed a guidebook that can inform park professionals, government bodies, and other interested stakeholders about inclusive designs that consider the needs of this population. Parks are an increasingly popular shelter choice for unhoused people, especially since the COVID-19 pandemic has increased the rate of homelessness and reduced shelter capacities. Just as there are many desirable features currently missing from parks, there is existing defensive architecture that is designed to subtly and negatively impact people experiencing homelessness. Our resource addresses the urgent need to prioritize the well-being and inclusion of the unhoused community and in the process makes parks better for everyone. To create this resource, we first conducted stakeholder interviews and a thorough literature review. Using that information, we compiled our resource and have been refining it based on the following three project requirements. So the first requirement is that our, it has to be engaging and we integrated ideas from people that our designs are intended to serve, which are park users. The second requirement is generality. Our designs and proposals have to be applicable to any park in Canada. And the third requirement is that it has to be feasible to implement. So um, we have to keep in mind bylaws, park size, budgets, and other park users to ensure that our designs are realistic and will help everyone. So Sarah Udo, who is a specialist in community engagement through planning, explained that one of the biggest mistakes when doing work such as this is only speaking to planners and designers. It is important to really listen and to speak to a variety of groups of people. So with this in mind, we conducted interviews with a variety of different stakeholders, including individuals with lived experience of homelessness, landscape architects, academics, and city employees and officials. Finding common desires and needs, considering policy constraints, and including stakeholders' ideas was a crucial part of creating the content. A weighted matrix enabled us to establish the best format to present our work and meet our clients' expectations. We were not looking to propose a solution to the systemic issues of homelessness, as many of those already exist. We chose to create a guidebook because we wanted a format that was feasible within the time frame of the MUCP course and would be sustainable after it ends. It should be informed by our stakeholders and be accessible to all audiences. So our chosen design solution is a guidebook with four subsections. Um, we summarized all our research and then we designed amenities and graphics to illustrate our suggestions. And we also regularly consulted with our client and supervisor throughout the guidebook writing, write editing um, and editing process. We'll now discuss the four subsections of our resource. The first section of our guidebook regards meeting basic human needs. Human beings all possess the right to security, shelter, sanitation, and clean water. Parks can play a critical role in providing access to these resources. Amenities like public washrooms and drinking fountains make parks more comfortable for everyone, but are especially important to those who face barriers in accessing these critical resources elsewhere. Providing food and food preparation options as well, ensure access to sanitation amenities, shelter from the elements, and supplying internet access and other technological amenities are several examples of designs that work to meet basic human needs. 
The second section of our guidebook is about safety and privacy. So designing for safety and privacy is essential to the well-being of unhoused residents living in parks. It provides a sense of security, which can allow people to feel comfortable leaving their encampment and belongings, engaging in homemaking, and establishing a sense of community with other park users. Non-invasive de design solutions such as motion sensor lighting, storage facilities, increased signage, and vegetation for visual cover can ensure parks are more accommodating of everyone using the space. So thirdly, we looked at the importance of using a harm reduction lens, which is a public health response that approaches substance use in an empathetic and non-stigmatizing way that avoids criminalization and promotes safe use and management. Many shelters prohibit substance use and parks can be a safer alternative to isolated public spaces because the community and visibility that they offer can help to reduce overdoses. However, conflict often occurs between encampment residents and housed folks surrounding needles, so amenities have to be designed to break the stigmas of drug use. Accessible sharp disposal bins reduce the psychological fears of drug use and reduce the physical, physical barriers of needle disposal. Redesigning bathrooms with better lighting, emergency buttons and other such benefits can create a safe space for all park users. For example, someone using substances can use these services, but also, for example, an older person who might have a fall can get in contact with the emergency services in this way. Um, one minute, uh, Warning. Thank you. Thank you. Our final section is community building. Increasing contact between housed and unhoused folks helps to unite communities and parks have the capacity to achieve this goal by offering space for social engagement. Social interaction helps to reduce the stigma of homelessness, improve community education and develop mutual respect. Park design should create inclusive social spaces which can promote and support smaller social interactions as well as sustained community programming. Further, multi-use amenities are great design interventions that can help foster interactions between park users and serve a variety of community needs. We have included a few of the visuals we developed to accompany our guidebook. Our first graphic illustrates the importance of providing a variety of amenity designs when designing an inclusive park. Giving bench and table options allows for adherence to accessibility standards while also rejecting defensive design practices. And our image on the bottom right is a design example that promotes community building and interaction through a multi-use structure. The combination of vendor stalls, notice boards, benches, tables, and lockers meets safety and privacy needs and provides agency to unhoused park users and housed park users alike. And we thank you for listening. Thank you very much, homeless and park uh, parks people. That was that was wonderful. Um, I am now opening it up to the floor. Uh, any of the clients or the um, uh, supervisors, if you have a question, now is your time. Um, I can jump in. It's Adri from Park People. Um, just a huge thank you to this incredible team that did um, such an amazing job tackling a complex topic um, with real creativity and, um, and respect for the different perspectives that we heard from. Um, I think I'll just allow others to jump in with questions since we've worked so closely on this, but um, just a big thank you to the team. Thank you. I see... Anandaga has his, uh, their hand up. Go ahead, please. Hi there. Um, I was just wondering, this all looks really great, but I was wondering, since um, Toronto can also get quite cold in the winter, if you have any, maybe I missed it, but any ideas on how to keep the unhoused warm during this time in parks as well? I can address this, guys, if that's okay. So one of the aspects in our meeting basic needs section specifically regards um, different temperatures that come in Toronto. Obviously we have four seasons here. So we, we do address winterizing certain amenities and also providing options for people in summers that are getting increasingly hot. So we, in our more specific solutions, we, we do address that, the, the changes in temperature and the impact this can have on the community and also the amenities themselves. I would also like to follow up um, the, the section about harm reduction. We look at how bathrooms and washrooms can be redesigned, but also how things like overdose prevention sites can be implemented in parks. So both of these include um, obviously indoor spaces. So with the bathrooms, we're looking at, for example, one stall without having an actual bathroom in it, but having kind of a chair and a ledge for things to be put on for both the housed and unhoused community. And again, with our overdose prevention sites, um, we're looking at how indoor spaces can be created or 
some parks with existing indoor spaces can be used for sort of more inclusive and more accessible purposes. Cool, thank you. I was also wondering if I have time to ask another quick question. Definitely, go ahead. Oh, okay, um, I was wondering, did you guys account for any extra space? I know you said more vegetation and stuff to prevent, uh, or to, sorry, to give cover and more privacy, but did you account for any space left open for people to put up tents and sort of like give themselves their own privacy space as well? Uh, yeah, I can talk about that a little bit. So one of the sections um, that we talked about for privacy and safety was about defining spatial boundaries. So we were kind of trying to explore the way of like how we can designate different areas for different uses so that, um, you know, for example, like people that are using the park for sleeping versus people that are using the park for like sports and recreation are still able to interact with those spaces and use them to the best of their abilities. So um, we were kind of like exploring how we can do that in a way that's not exclusionary of people um, that have different uses for the spaces, but still um, making sure that there was different areas for, for different activities. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think that's a good idea. I mean, also just making sure that you don't, I feel like it might be a bit marginalizing to put them in a different or like put all the tents in one area. Almost, it seems like they're enclosed in that area. So maybe allowing them to be spread out could be a nice idea. Thank you, Onondaga. Um, have you got any other questions or is that, that's it for you? That's all right, yeah, thank you. Oh, awesome. David, uh, you've got your hand up. You wanna go ahead, David, yeah. when you have a second? Sure. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for the team. It was a pleasure working with you and also with Audrey um, at Park People. Uh, it was nice to reconnect and work on this project together. Um, I just a couple of questions that that uh, that I think would be interesting to everybody listening is one: um, if you could identify what the biggest barrier for designing with dignity um, might be in, in Canada, uh, what might be that barrier? And then two, um, are there any examples that you drew inspiration from of places that are, are doing better than what we're doing in, in Toronto? Um, I would like to start by talking about some examples that are in place. Um, I think just for the first question, the biggest barrier, I feel like it varies for a lot of people. Um, you know, there's the stigmatization of people experiencing homelessness. There's like the divide between housed and unhoused users. Um, I think so that there are a few different things. I think it depends on the issue and depends on the person. But in terms of real life examples, um, Vancouver, there have been examples in Vancouver of some really great pop up overdose prevention sites, as well as some examples of house spaces, current spaces in parks, like spaces with an indoor shelter have been used as sites for overdose prevention and harm reduction lens. Um, so Vancouver is a good example for kind of leading the way with temporary pop-up sites, but um, our resource guidebook obviously goes into more detail in all this, and it does talk about the fact that the issue is that too many of these are temporary. Um, and so we haven't really found any good examples of um, long-term sites in parks. There's also a, across Canada, a variety of parks in different areas that though not implementing all of the different things we've suggested have implemented certain things. So for example, there's a park in Quebec that has a kitchenette installed with running water that allows for community members to use the park spaces and also gather to eat and like eat food and make food together. So there are examples of each different thing. And I think that's the, what we're trying to achieve with our guidebook is to provide a wide range of examples for what could be implemented in different park spaces, whether you implement one thing or implement 10 different things. Um, so we haven't observed anywhere that has implemented everything we've suggested, but there are examples throughout the country of one or two aspects of what we've discussed being implemented in park spaces. 
Another interesting example is um, the use of also the implementation of needle dis sharps disposal bins. Um, we, we've had some mixed opinions about how these should be designed, but um, in Manhattan, there was the big program to implement um, sharps disposal bins and they were very careful with where they did it. So they were located in places where sort of syringe and needles have been found in sort of more concentrated spaces. So that's an example of how the sort of spatial awareness went into where they were located, but also they designed their bins in a sort of artistic manner to help them fit in with the natural environment. Um, so we've heard from some people that, that, that this type of design isn't great and that instead the design should be very obvious for what it is. Um, however, in terms of the artistic element, we've heard from some of our stakeholder interviews that a lot of, a lot of the people living in parks are artists. Um, so we've thought of ways that we could sort of incorporate different ideas from different examples. So Manhattan's use of putting drop boxes in specific places, as well as other examples of using art either for these drop boxes or for some of the other designs that we're wanting to implement. Great, thank you. Um, thank you to uh, Homeless and Parks. Um, wonderful work. Um, the next group is Bronte Forward. Bronte Forward has, uh, we've got actually two presentations uh, for uh, the Bronte BIA. One is, uh, the first one will be done by the group. The second one, uh, I'm gonna share my screen. It's a, a single student and I will um, play it from here. So let's uh, first start with the Bronte Forward team. Go ahead and get set up. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. I can hear you well. Great, I'll get started then. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our presentation on walkability improvements in Bronte Village. Firstly, for some quick context, uh, our Bronte Village is a business district uh, within the town of Oakville, and the Business Improvement Area, or BIA for short, is a body that represents the businesses within it. Bronte has a very large senior population, and this was a key consideration as part of our project. The problem we identified was that Bronte Village has inad inadequate walkability, and this poses a significant challenge for Bronte seniors. We looked at walkability in three different components, safety, which addresses the risk of injury in walking, wayfinding, which addresses the ability to navigate an area, and vibrancy, which addresses the factors that lead to people lingering within an area. Moving on to the evaluation criteria, uh, we created alternatives for each of the walkability components, then evaluated them against three criteria. First is walkability impact, which is the walkability benefit generated by the alternative. It was measured differently for each walkability component. Labor is a criterion because the BIA is a small organization, uh, so they can't take on projects that take a lot of time and effort. Low cost was also a requirement, with the budget constraint of $25,000 annually for all solutions combined. With that, let's look at three designs uh, for each of the walkability components, uh, starting with safety. For increasing safety in Bronte, we propose temporary curb extensions. These are traffic calming measures made of paint and flexible posts to narrow the roadway, making crosswalk distances shorter. Seniors on average have a slower walking speed, so this solution reduces pedestrian exposure to moving traffic when crossing the street. Temporary curb extensions also help tighten the intersection corners, which make cars turn slower, decreasing the risk of collision. This is especially important for senior pedestrians as they can be more likely uh, to be seriously injured uh, in a collision. This solution falls under the jurisdictions of the town of Oakville, so the, effort, so the effort from the BIA is minimized. All they have to do is advocate for it, and it's also low cost since the town will be bearing most of the cost. The Capstone team has developed design criteria and design proposals for this solution, which will help the BIA partner with the town's transportation department. Our next, our next solution is directional signage. A total of 24 signs would be installed at two intersections in the BIA as a pilot program, showing directions and the time taken to walk to, walk to three key destinations. Uh, it helps make the area more navigable, 
It encourages walking through uh, the principles of gamification and positive messaging, which are two psychological principles which have been found to increase walking rates in seniors. And it also helps reduce the perceived distances to destinations, which have been found to be a problem in suburban areas. The signage has been designed by the UFT capstone team and uh, will need to be installed by the B will simply need to be installed by the BIA after printing. This is a low cost solution as it, as it fits well within the BIA's budget. The last solution that we have is uh, regarding reverency is QR code and website. So we designed a new community event web page section to share updates of the most recent events in Bronte on the Bronte Village website. And we created a customized QR code directing to the website for convenient access in public spaces. Uh, in terms of the workability impact of this solution, uh, it enhanced access to event information that encourages like locals to linger in the area. And also it improved social connectedness to fulfill seniors needs to stay emotionally engaged within the community. Visitors can also walk around and see the, what event is happening in the area and enjoy what the BIA has to offer. Uh, a slow effort from the BIA as we have existing layouts for them to implement the web, web uh, page section. And it's also low cost as fits well in, within the BIA's budget. Last but not, not the least, we are gonna briefly talk about the development plan of our all of our solutions. Uh, first one is the temporary curb extensions. BIA can reach out to the town of Oakfield's transportation division to, to with, with the design proposal to advocate for the safety measure. And in terms of the in terms of for the solution of the directional signage, the BIA can connect with the business to finalize the exact location to place them and then order order the signage and install them. For the last solution, the BI will need to implement the web page section easily using their ex existing layouts and they can print QR codes on secret label and attach them within the area. That's the end of our uh, presentation. Uh, feel free to ask us any questions if you have. Thank you, Bronte Forward Group. Um, for any clients, supervisors, other faculty, go ahead and ask questions now. Hi, it's Maureen. I'm the client with Bronte Forward. Hi, guys. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you for all the hard work. Uh, in addition to um, cracking the nut, which you would think would be a simple thing, walkability, uh, but it's not. And in particular, dealing with a lot of uh, challenges about the makeup of the group and changes in uh, number of students on the group that they did endure and they persevered. So thank you for all your hard work. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Maureen. Would anybody else like to? Uh, oh, Onondaga, you have your hand raised. Yes, sorry. Um, I was wondering if there was any work you did to improve the accessibility of this area, particularly for those who might use a wheelchair or something like that. As part of our initial uh, in, initial uh, initial alternatives that we had prepared, that was uh, one of the key considerations. However, one of the uh, a major constraint that we or like a, an issue that we had as part of the project is uh, a lot any accessibility improvements or uh, uh, things of that sort would have to be implemented as uh, by the town of Oakville. Uh, as such, we limited uh, any sort of uh, work that would be have to be that have to be done externally to one solution that we sort of put in. As part of the safety solution, the final design didn't uh, include ac accessibility specifically. It focused more on the safety elements, which uh, Mahia, you can elaborate more on, I guess. Yeah, um, there were some um, accessibility aspects of it that um, included in other alternatives, but the alternatives that we chose um, particularly do not um, like do not. Um, address accessibility, but uh, for example, the curb extensions, uh, the, the design criteria does account for it in where um, uh, the posts are uh, placed and things like that to account for accessibility. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Onondaga. Has anyone else got any uh, comments or questions for this group?
Okay, if there are no more uh, questions, then uh, thank you very much, Bronte Forward Group Number One. Uh, next, I will share um, Shalina Terrence's um, Bronte Fall Village Walkability Improvements. Um, uh, I'll share my screen with her video. Catherine, we can't hear anything. Okay, sorry about that. I thought I'd sorted this out. On the bottom, when you share the screen on the bottom left, there's a box that you click to share the audio. Okay, hold on just a second. Sorry, guys. Stop sharing and then go back into sharing and before and at that point. You can go oh, okay. Box. Sorry. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, tell me again, where is that box? So go to share, select the, um, the uh, app that you're using. In the bottom left, there's a checkoff box that says share the audio. Share sound? Yeah. Okay. Mono or stereo, it says. Okay, doesn't matter, I suppose. All right, let me try this again. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Shalina Terrence, and specific steam for this project is to redesign a crosswalk to better enhance elderly pedestrian visibility mm -hmm. while crossing a road. As you can see, uh, I will be basing this project on the poster submission. A good pro crosswalk promotes safety for pedestrians because it increases road visibility for both near low and high traffic intersections. Some guidelines to keep in mind were where to stop yielding to pedestrians and pedestrian crossing, roadway materials, cycling facilities, pavement markings, and tactile walking surface indicators, which have all been implemented in the redesign process. The implementation of the new crosswalk will be on all main intersections of Bronte Road based on consultations from private contractors and VRAs around each intersection, which makes it a busier place. And you can find that in the QR code in the right hand corner. So choosing a substance was the first checklist, as you can see, and thermoplastic paint was chosen due to the hierarchy um, from the different substances that were there mainly because of a maximum of seven years or, or more of durability and it's an expensive um, linear foot uh, amount. The second checklist, as you can see, um, was based on the design layout of the intersection that will be implemented and 3D design layout was implemented in Thailand, which was used in the specific research and redesign process. We found, I found that 3D markings um, was implemented in the past by multiple places around the world and has proved to be successful in pedestrian safety, which is one of our primary goals. Lastly, choosing a private contractor to implement these first two processes was the next step in finding three popular contractors were very crucial and Upper Canada Road Services has met all the design criteria and after a consultation with them by m myself, I was able to understand the differences between three different contractors and chose Upper Canada Road. Um, because it is inexpensive comparatively to the other three. Before I close, I'll summarize on our main points. Bronte Village Vocal, consisting of a majority of elderly citizens in the small city, where walkability is a frequent issue. Um, through research and analysis, changing the layout of the crosswalk marking in accordance with the town of Oakville was thought to be an optimal solution, where thermoplastic markings consisting of 3D markings by a private contractor, Upper Canada Road Services, was discovered. The budget of this proposed design is approximately 46000 with the one-time free maintenance installment at the end of the fifth year, which was discussed in the consultation call with Upper Canada Road Services. I would like to thank the client Maureen for answering questions regarding the process of this project and supporting the team with meetings, and my sincere thanks to our supervisor, Professor Sachs, for guiding me through this project. I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Okay. Terrific. Now, um, 
the last of our uh, of our presentations is going to be reimagining music venues. Uh, can you, uh, uh, the team reimagining music venues? Can you get ready? Good evening, everyone. We're really pleased to share the results of our work over the past year in consultation with Wavelength to reimagine music venues. We've developed a design proof for a stage truck meant for use by the DIY, grassroots, and nonprofit music community. Our research and design process centers on Toronto, but is intended to serve as a case study for the numerous urban communities that make up Ontario's creative ecosystem. The concept of the stage truck works from existing knowledge and practices around the use of outdoor mobile stages and stage vehicles, many of which have gained a particular importance for the live music scene during the COVID-19 pandemic. The stage truck offers an innovation as it is designed specifically for grassroots music presentation in urban settings. It's equipped with everything its diverse set of users might need in their work, a group that makes up a significant market and more importantly, an impactful cultural force in Canada's music city. Through its build form and operating model, the stage truck is an agile, affordable and appealing piece of infrastructure. And my colleague Kelly will tell you some of, it, some of its physical features. Our design repurposes an existing step truck, more specifically the 18 foot Chevrolet P30, one of the more popular models because of its cost effectiveness, maneuverability and weight handling abilities. The overall concept of our design is that the truck will fold out into a ready to play stage with minimal setup that supports six musicians. When open, the stage stands at 18 feet in height, sorry, 10 feet in height, 18 feet in length, and 12 feet in depth. The series of drawings presented on the screen show different elevations of the truck, both opened and closed. The stage will open out on the passenger side of the truck, while a sheltered green room will open out on the back side of the truck. The back side of the truck is equipped with an accessibility ramp where, and this is where musicians will enter and exit the stage. In the elevations and section shown, you start to get a better sense of how the truck will function. The driver's side wall of the truck will open upwards to create a roof for the green room that is walled by drapes that fall from the roof when it's opened. The stage possesses similar characteristics. The passenger side wall and roof of the truck will open upwards to reveal and shelter the stage. Once opened, an extension is pulled out from the body's floor to enlarge the stage's depth. Black drapes will also fall from the stage roof and a back wall to shelter performers to create a solid background for co cohesive lighting and presentation. The stage is fully equipped with everything needed to put on a concert. It will be powered by a generator and it possesses everything from lighting, speakers, and a full drum kit. The stage will come with all of the necessary cables and microphone, as well as six monitors, two PA speakers, two subwoofers, one combo bass amp, and one combo guitar amp. The front stage, the front of the stage also provides a space where presenters can hang a banner of their choosing for further customization. While the truck's physical features address the tangible needs for DIY presenters and artists, not all of its potential contributions are inherent to its physical form. The sound policy and programming models that accompany the design help to advance the more intangible and qualitative needs for the community. Our feasibility study includes a policy and programming toolkit to envision the stage truck under a public, private, or social enterprise operating model, which was informed by our stakeholder engagement with artists and presenters in Toronto. The truck helps to build up organizations by saving on costs. So, for example, rather than spending significant portions of a budget to rent portable stages, presenters can allocate these funds towards building up their organization or collective. Furthermore, the truck gives power to create new geographies of music in the city, mitigate barriers to entry, and advance industry goals around equity, diversity, and inclusion at large. Our market scan showed that there are expensive stages that don't include audio-visual equipment, or they're all inclusive but not suitable for more sophisticated performances with amplified sound. The stage truck speaks directly to presenters, promoters, and artists' needs with the right equipment, yet allows for customization and at a highly competitive rate. We examined the market for mobile stages across Ontario and accounted for Toronto's denser music scene to establish upfront investment, fixed and variable costs, as you can see here. This included industry recommended AV equipment and freelance tech wages. Our revenue modeling accounted for a free use model, a margin based model and a competitive market based model. 
Using our cost projections and utilization rate projection, we calculated two break-even scenarios, one with a three-year time frame and one with a five-year time frame. The stage truck can break even within either time frame while charging 50% less than the average outdoor staging rental in Toronto, proving its financial viability. The stage truck represents an exciting development and a show of commitment for the live music scene in Toronto. We want to thank our supervisor, Professor Dan Silver, and our client, Johnny Bunce of Wavelength Music, for their support and generosity with their time. We are happy to answer any of your questions now. Oh, sorry, chatting away here. Thank you very much to the Reimagining Music venues. Uh, I'm going to open it up right now for the um, for any questions, supervisor, client questions, other profs. Go ahead. I just want to say thank you so much to the this amazing team on reimagining music venues for your hard work. Such a, an imaginative proposal. I was not expecting this when I began this project with this team. And I just love the idea of taking the idea of a music venue and making it mobile and decentralized and something that can activate the entire city with live music. So kudos for all your hard work and great research and professional delivery on this presentation. And I'm really hoping that someone will be able to make the stage truck a reality. We hope so too. Thanks so much, Johnny. Thank you, Johnny. Has anybody else got any comments or questions for this group? Hi, everybody. I just, yeah, I just wanted to echo what Johnny said. I mean, it has been a real pleasure working on this project with this team and with Johnny, and we've been a very uh, good working group. And especially what Johnny was saying about, um, you know, this, 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 uh, project started out in a very open way and we really didn't know where it would end up and to see how it sort of evolved through the entire design process was really inspiring. Um, and also I think it's nice to see it here at the end and together with all these other projects, we can see how they kind of fit together and trying to think about, you know, how Toronto can adapt to making this kind of categorical leap it's on the way to making, you know, to a, a bigger, denser, kind of more dynamic city. And not just to make it a one-time change, but to create things that allow us to keep adapting as as it continues to evolve. And this this is, uh, I think, one key part of bringing the cultural sector um, on board with that that kind of vision. I think the main question is, how are we going to make it happen for real? Because it does have a lot of potential. And we did just uh, present this, or the team presented this to you know some real stakeholders in this area, and they were really excited about it. So I think that's the main question: like, how can we turn this into a reality? Thanks, Dan. Does anybody else have any other questions for the uh, Reimagining Music Venues group? Then if not, I want to say thank you to everybody. That was a tremendous presentation, a group of presentations tonight. Um, everybody did an amazing job. Uh, I'm like to pass it back to uh, Professor Mark Fox, who, who heads the MUCP. Um, Mark, would you like to have any final words? Uh, good question. Um, I just want to echo what uh, Catherine had said. Everybody did a great job. I'm always amazed at the, uh, at the quality of work and professionalism of our teams. Um, uh, it's getting to the point that I'm no longer surprised, but it, uh, you all exceed the bar on a regular basis, so thank you very much. Um, and I also like to, to echo Dan's, uh, Dan Silver's uh, words in the sense that uh, we're getting an increasing number of City of Toronto uh, sponsored projects, and um, I look forward to seeing how the partnership between University of Toronto and City of Toronto uh, can move Toronto forward in a number of directions that are represented by the projects that we saw today. And so uh, I think the team should be proud of the work that they've done. I think the team should be proud of the impact and potential impact uh, that they're having on the city. 
and uh, I also want to wish all the teams uh, good luck. I know this is the end of fourth year. Uh, you're moving out into the uh, working world, and I think your experience, I hope your experience uh, with the MUCP program uh, has had a positive effect on, uh, on you and your abilities to uh, move forward in life. So thank you. Thank you, sponsors. Thank you, supervisors. Uh, really appreciate it. Okay, well, that does conclude our event for this evening. And uh, as Mark said, we, I would like to uh, echo his uh, thanks to everybody. This was a wonderful presentation and, um, and kudos to you all. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>